You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real-world music producers and audio professionals. Hey guys, and welcome back to Secret Sonics. I'm your host, Ben Wallach. I hope you enjoyed the brand new theme music that you heard for the first time today on this episode with Daniel Silberman. Um, I want to thank Svi Rodan for laying down some drums, uh, Yakir Hyman for laying down some guitars, and Mendy Portnoy for laying down the keys on this track. I did the bass and kind of came up with the arrangement and the production, but it all kind of started with Svi's drum groove. And uh, figured it would be cool to get people involved and make a collaborative little fun jam situation for the theme song of this podcast. So this is the brand new theme of Secret Sonics, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks to everybody who contributed. Uh, Without further ado, today's episode is with Daniel Silberman. I really enjoyed my conversation with him, and I learned a ton, and I think you will too. So here it is, Daniel Silberman on Secret Sonics. Hello, and welcome back to Secret Sonics. I'm your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Daniel Silberman, Chicagoland native and seven-time award-winning producer, engineer, composer, and musician. Daniel Silberman started his musical journey at the age of 10 when he picked up the double bass for the first time. His formal training includes three classical performance degrees from around the world, including a Master of Music from the Royal Academy of Music in London, a BA from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, and a diploma from the Interlochen Arts Academy. Dan has always loved to play music of all genres, which has afforded him him the opportunity to work and perform with Grammy Award winning nominated artists and groups such as Lady Gaga, Chris Martin, Chicago, and others. In some of the most popular venues, uh, including United Center, Lincoln Center, Symphony Hall, Shoreline Amphitheater, etc., throughout the world. Uh, his playing has been featured on national public radios from the top and on major label releases, movies, and video games, including Sony, DECA, Naxos, and Universal, to name a few. His own music has been featured on Chicago's classical radio station, WFMT, and musicians from the Chicago Symphony and other major orchestras throughout the world have performed his compositions and arrangements. In 2012, Daniel departed from his career in music performance to start up his own studio and production company. His meticulous attention to detail, his extensive musical training, and his insistence on the highest quality and finest sounding new and vintage equipment all set him apart from most producers, engineers in today's digital age of music recording and producing. He has been fortunate in his career to work with such talented people as Morrissey, Chicago Symphony, Osborne, and Jack Kramer. The eclectic nature of his musical preferences and experiences renders him uniquely qualified for any and all types of musical genres. Daniel is open-minded and flexible, curious, honest, and always on top of the latest trends, techniques, and styles of the industry. Most importantly, though, he loves to share the joy that creativity and music can provide with as many people as he can. Uh, Former guest Packy Lundholm recommended I reach out to Daniel, so it's a pleasure to have him on. Welcome to Secret Sonics, Dan. It's great to be here, Ben. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So... Tell us a bit about how you got started getting involved in the music production thing. Sure. Um, well, like you kind of said in uh, my bio, I started playing at a young age uh, through school system and everything like that. Kind of did that for a while. Started taking music seriously uh, halfway through high school. Um, went to Interlochen, went, uh, did my undergrad in uh, San Francisco, and my master's at the Royal Academy in London. Um, and all with a classical music performance background. Um, by the end of my uh, master's, I realized uh, that performance and that route of performance and going through auditions and all that just wasn't for me anymore. Um, I very much fell out of love with it. And uh, I had been talking to my advisor at the time, trying to figure out some sort of life plan and you know figure out what I could do with the last, you know, 16 years of my life that I had devoted to this and, you know, making this a thing. And, uh, wow. Do do you mind if I just cut in and ask like what, what changed? Like how did your, your heart change so drastically? It, you know, it was one of these weird situations where, um, I was in a foreign country. Uh, you know, I had, you know, we had friends and all that stuff and I had friends and, but there was this one thing that I always kind of remembered, uh, one of my teachers saying from way back when is like, you know, even in the darkest hours, like you can always find some sort of solace in art. And 
I was extremely depressed when I was there. Uh, you know, I, for some reason, I didn't like living there. I didn't like the politics of the school that I was in. And I was kind of over it. And I realized that normally in past situations, whenever I was in that kind of funk, um, I'd be fine practicing six to eight hours a day and kind of just, you know, being able to do that. And uh, that just stopped. I realized I didn't enjoy practicing anymore. I didn't enjoy kind of the route that I was taking. And I think at that moment, I kind of, the writing was on the wall and I just realized like, hey, you know, if you're not, if you're not in this right now and this is like a dark time, like I think it's time to start rethinking life because you, you know, you got to enjoy what you do. And if you're going to be doing this for a long time, you know, I don't want to wake up and be that jaded musician in 20 years who's been doing the audition circuit and maybe landed a good orchestral gig, but you know, just doesn't enjoy what he's doing anymore. And uh, yeah, wow. (laughs) <laughs> it's like deep thoughts for only being in, ma- in masters in your master's degree, you know. <laughs> and and so I just you know I bit the bullet and was like, hey, I I need to change this up and um, yeah. and kind of fell upon this new uh, sect of music that you know I had done when I was younger when I you know when we all had high school bands and all that stuff, but never took it seriously. And you know, listening back to those recordings, they're I mean, they're awful, obviously, because they were done in yeah. high school. But, you know, it it was still like thinking about those memories and thinking about um, like the time and stuff that went into it and was like, hey, you know, this this actually could be fun. And, you know, I was getting work as an arranger and, and composition uh, all throughout my undergrad and master's. So, you know, I was already used to writing and in some ways – arranging. So I kind of already had a feel for it plus with all the schooling and, you know, counterpoint studies and symphony studies and all that stuff, you know, I I was kind of in a way my brain was kind of trained to see that scope of things from the start and like how you build something up and mm. how you yeah, can yeah. tear it down and like how you can make something complex but not so, you know, sound complex. And um, so I just kind of dove in. And um, luckily at the time, uh, I was living only like a few blocks away from Abbey Road. And um, (laughs) my school had a connection with them. And I was able to go in, talk to people, you know, really kind of um, gain some insight on things, you know, talk about certain um, issues and concerns I might have had and this and that. And, uh, when I kind of realized like, oh, like this could be a lot of fun. Like, you know, this could be like not throwing away half of my, more than half of my life at that point of all these hours of practicing and all this dedication to this music thing that, you know, yeah. let's, let's see this out. And uh, I can happily say that even in my darkest moments at the time, I still love what I do. It's like, it doesn't matter. It it could be, you know, we all get bad gigs and even in the bad gigs, there's still light. And I think that to me is the, the thing that I can't stress enough for people. Like if that's not your job and, you know, and you can attainably get to that spot in another job that can actually make you happy and make you want to get up and work even under like, some of the worst working conditions, like you're excited, yeah. that's, I mean, that's where you want to be. And I'm so fortunate to be in the place that I'm at because if I wasn't, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sure I'd be doing something else that I was, that I was only feeling miserable all the time about. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think people who get into this get into it because they're so passionate about it and it just feels like the only thing they can do, like... Not in the sense of like that's the only thing they could physically do, you know, as a job, but like, like they can't even understand doing another gig because they're so deep into it, you know. Exactly, exactly. So it's it's kind of a weird thing, but you know, at the end of the day, like I said, I'm super fortunate that I took mm-hmm. the journey, and it, you know, it obviously hasn't been easy. There's been ups and downs, but at the end sure. of the day, you know, things have worked out, and. I'm very fortunate and lucky about that, you know, even with all the crazy stuff going on at the moment, which is just unreal. Um, 
you know, there's something still really awesome. Like, you know, I would say during this whole COVID thing, I haven't had the urge to really pick up instruments at all, but it hasn't, yeah. it, but it hasn't stopped me from coming down and doing like mixing and stuff like that, or, you know, stuff that isn't related to that. Like there's still, you know, like I said, even in the darkest time, I'm still enjoying, you know, bobbing my head, getting through it and trying to, you know, make good music. Wow. Well, so there's a lot of things I want to ask you about now, but, sure. but, bef- but like before before we even like jump ahead to the present time and like <laughs> what what you're up what you're up to now and COVID and all that stuff, uh, what was it like to go into Abbey Road as like I guess a total noob? Like, did you did you, were you aware of the the history in that place? Did was it were you intimidated? Like, it, it was, was or what? what it, yeah. Yes, yes, and no. Um, it was cool because obviously it's you know Abbey Road um, and one of my favorite albums of all time was cut there so you know it's walking in and seeing um that room and you know just kind of like being like oh shit like this is what happened here this happened are you referring to a specific beatles album uh i am i'm actually not a beatles fan (laughs) really (laughs) yeah uh, oh no i know right the we're gonna have to we're gonna have to end this interview right now that's, sorry man. that's <laughs> I'm yeah I, i'm not surprised but <laughs> no that that it's always surprising when i hear i know a couple people that aren't fans of the beatles and it, it's just it's like it's crazy for me so it's because there's yeah it, it's not that i'm not a fan because it's hard to not be a musician and uh not be a fan of the beatles um for me i grew up on the rolling stones so I was always on the stone side of things. Um, still to this day, you know, I would very much rather listen to like Sticky Fingers, Bridges, and all that stuff, and Exile over the White Album and all that stuff. And I think wow. for me, it's just the, the energy and how things are working. Like the thing that I love about the Stones is nothing is right, but the sum of the parts makes it right. You know what I mean? Mm. And, yeah. um, I think that's kind of the cool part. Whereas like the Beatles, I respect in such a way that, you know, with only a minimal amount of instruments and, you know, sub mixing and all this stuff, like they were doing a lot for their time. And like that yeah. part of it is awesome. And yes, I know pretty much all the words to Beatles songs and can play yeah. most of the Beatles songs and so on and so forth. And I, you know, I respect that music so much. Um, and, but for me, I would, I've never really been a John Lennon fan, both Beatles and after. Um, mm-hmm. However, I absolutely love Paul McCartney and like everything he's ever done. I am like, that's some of my biggest influences, like, you know, wings and stuff like that. And, mm, um, yeah. and obviously George Harrison. I mean, you, you can't go wrong with George. Yeah. George, I feel like everyone likes George, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's so interesting you say that. Like, I actually, I really love the Stones. Also, like, I think the Stones are great, and I and they have an energy to them that's completely different than the Beatles. I don't even think of it as like a debate. But what I think the the Beatles have that really is amazing, and like, I don't think I just don't think an, that another group together has written so many amazing songs. Right. Uh, it's, I think they're just the songwriting, and like, I don't know. I don't know if you saw that movie. Like, this is so off topic, but I love it. <laughs> uh, so. But but I don't know if you saw the movie yesterday. But like it oh, was it God. was okay. It started off, it started off okay and it kind of got really bad towards the end. But but what was great about that movie was like you just see how good the songs are. The songs just stand up, you know. Anyways, that's my point about the Beatles, I guess. Fair. So enough. what's your favorite record? So, what's your record that? <laughs> so my favorite record that came out of that place uh, was Dark Side of the Moon. Oh, and still is. Okay. I'm uh, that that was, I didn't realize that was recorded in Abbey Road. I thought it was recorded somewhere else. Nope. Dark Side of the Moon was Alan Parsons in Studio Two, um, and uh, wow, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that uh, okay, that probably is like the biggest one of the biggest albums for me as a kid growing up. Sure, um, that I mean, it's one of the few albums that from top to tail is literally perfect. Like, there's yeah. not really a cut on it that's a bad song, and you know, you can make it from top to tail and just be like, whoa, like this, this was a journey. Like it, you know, everything, everything was tied together. Everything, you know, it was this huge kind of moment for me. And it was like, oh my God, like, how are you getting these sounds? And like, where are these things coming from? And, you know, 
that part of it for me was just like, oh my God, like this is where Nick Mason was. And this is where... You- 